Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome once again to Word Pictures. We are uh, thrilled to have you with us again if you're one of our continuing viewers and even more thrilled if you're uh, a new viewer uh, for our broadcast here. If you've been following us, <clears throat> then you know that we have been exploring the magnificent book of Revelation for the last, uh, oh, about 13 broadcasts. And tonight we're going to take a very serious look at, um, at some of the mysterious, um, the mysterious images in chapter 17. These images are of, of strange beasts, uh, of the description of um, <clears throat> can be found no place else other than the Bible and have caused people to ponder for many years. Uh, we're going to try and um, kind of define or accurately describe what some of those beasts might truly represent tonight. If you would like to join me by opening your Bible, uh, the book of Revelation chapter 17, uh, verse 7, I'm going to begin to read there and I'm reading from uh, today's English version. When I saw her, I was completely amazed. Why were you amazed? The angel asked me. And of course, this is a vision being given to John the Revelator. I will tell you the secret meaning of the woman and of the beast that carries her, the beast with seven heads and ten horns. That beast was once alive, but lives no longer. It is about to come up from the abyss and will go off to be destroyed. The people living on the earth whose names have not been written before the creation of the world in the book of the living will be amazed as they look at the beast. It was once alive, now it no longer lives, but it will reappear. This calls for wisdom and understanding. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five of them have fallen and one still rules and the other one has not come. When he comes, he must rule only a little while. And the beast that was once alive but lives no longer is itself an eighth king who is one of the seven and is going off to be destroyed. Ken, there are, uh, this is only the beginning of the, of the perplexing yes. uh, beings described here. Um, get our listeners straightened out today. Boy, I hope so. Well, we've noticed here in Revelation, uh, in some of these chapters, there was chapter 12, there was chapter 13, we had a lot of beasts and doing various kinds of things, and we suggested earlier that chapter 17 through 19 is a sort of expansion on, on chapter 13, and that in turn is an expansion on the last five verses of Revelation 12. So we're, we're repeating this, and we're, God, I think, is hoping that we'll figure it out. So I guess this is our last chance. We've done Revelation 12, we've done Revelation 13. Now we're going to see if we can figure out who these various creatures are. And there's a lot of them. Let's, let's start out. Just a little bit of, of review. Read Revelation th uh, 17, verse 3. The Spirit took control of me, and the angel carried me to a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a red beast that had names insulting to God written all over it. It's, the beast had seven heads and ten horns. Now, there's something very interesting to observe here in this verse. What color is the beast? Red. Scarlet. Red. 
So I think some translate scarlet, but it's a red scarlet. Do we know any other red beasts that we've studied? Red horse? Not everybody's speaking up really on t really quick, are they? Is the dragon red or not? Well, look at chapter uh, 12 and verse 3. Remember this red beast has how many heads? Red dragon. Back on 17? Seven, Seven heads. heads and ten horns. Horns, okay. Here we see another mysterious sight. I'm reading 12, verse 3. I'm also reading the Good News Bible, the today's English version. Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and a crown on each of its heads. Okay? So this is a red dragon, okay? We all together with that? A red beast? When we go over, now a lot of people suggest, well maybe this is the leopard-bodied beast, but if we go over to Revelation 13 and we read in verse 1, then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, so same number of heads, some number of horns. On each of its horns there was a crown, on each of its heads there was a name that was insulting to God. But this beast looks like a leopard with a bear's feet and a mouth like a lion's mouth, and there's nothing about it being red. So we go back to our package there and our, our verse back in Revelation 17. If it says the beast is red, who are we talking about? Probably the dragon. It must be the dragon. Yeah. No. And who is the dragon in Revelation 12? Satan. 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 So believe it or not, we have, if you remember our discussion from last time, we have the, the woman who was supposed to be the church now riding on the back of the devil. Satan. What's happened? She went into the wilderness alone and pure. She comes out riding the devil and dressed with all sorts of garments of royalty or possibly garments of prostitution. Um, they somehow or other seem to be so, similar. So, so this, the, the uh, dragon can also be re referred to as a beast. Uh, the yes. Way, the way re if, you, if you put re uh, yeah. Revelation 12 in there, so it's a beast, but here in 13, the beast, excuse me, the dragon gave the power to the beast. Yeah. And it hasn't defined who, no. we have to define who that beast is, but uh, the dragon can either be a dragon and it's also a beast. Yeah, the dragon is also a beast. Okay. So now we come to... But it has the power to give power to another beast. Yes, definitely. That, that's what that we're seeing yeah. here. Um, now we go to verse 4 and we notice some interesting, interesting things, that's 4 and 5. In, in Revel, back in Revelation 17, the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and covered with gold ornaments, precious stones, and pearls. Now those are, those are, those are in, symbols of wealth, right? Either high government authority and power or somebody who's doing very well and maybe in prostitution. Because it goes on to say, in her hand she held a gold cup full of obscene and filthy things, the result of her immorality. So that tends to make us want to say this is a result of her prostitution, right? These colors, purple and uh, scarlet, are very common in the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Yes, well, they are. On her forehead, verse 5, was written a name that has a secret meaning, Great Babylon, the mother of all prostitutes and perverts in the world. Boy, now that's not a name you would want, I don't think. So what we do we know about Babylon? <clears throat> it's been another name for Rome. What, used okay, in back in New Testament times, it was another name for Rome, wasn't it? Right. So are we drawing the conclusion here that something has happened to, something has happened here is to the church? Yes. The church was pure as it came from, let's say, the time of the disciples. Mm -hmm. But then something has happened to the church that has become corrupt. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. It sounds like it. So, Let's notice now what we know about Babylon. Have we talked about Babylon elsewhere in Revelation? Well, Revelation 14.8, known that, notice that, that's in the middle of what? Chapter 14, 6 through 12 are the three angels' messages, right? Ch verse 8, a second angel followed the first one saying, she has fallen great, Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of immoral lust. And if we, we haven't got to Revelation 18 yet, we'll be there hopefully another week or two. Uh, 
But Revelation 8 and 18 is an expansion on, on this eighth verse here, so it talks a lot about Babylon, okay? And a hint about what it might be, what the early disciples might have been talking about when they talked about of great Babylon is found in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 13 and this is just at the very end of Peter's first book to the Christians written somewhere near the end of his life which at which time he may have been preaching in Rome or he may even have been in prison in Rome and he says your sister church in Babylon also chosen by God sends you greetings and so does my son Mark and it's interesting to notice that even the American Bible Society that puts together my translation here says, as in the book of Revelation, this probably refers to Rome. Now that's not one church is speaking, that's the American Bible Society. So there's pretty good evidence within scripture that this Babylon expression refers to Rome. Now, Rome, are they talking in the context of the Rome back then? The we haven't answered that. Haven't answered that question yet. I know, but it but could, as far as the it, Bible Society goes, well, it could be either one. It could be either Rome back then, which many Bible scholars today would say, God, not even God can predict the future, and we're not sure we believe in the devil. So therefore, they would say, these Bible scholars that I do not agree with would say that this contest is between imperial Rome, the, the power of Rome in those days, versus um, the, what's, what came to be known as imperial Roman cult, the idea that some of the Roman Caesars were going to end up being gods and should be worshipped. So, of course now, now Peter, when he refers to this, when he, when he makes this Babylonian attribution here, he hasn't had access to John's writings. No, not at so, all. So um, it, it's reasonable to assume that this isn't, when, he, when he's using Babylon, it's not in a prophetic sense. Why, why is Peter ref, would be referring to Rome well, as, as Babylon? Okay, hold on a second. <coughs> we, there, there's, uh, we don't have time to go and explore Peter's writings right now, but if you read the last part of chapter 5 of 1 Peter and 2 Peter chapter 1, because they were not written too far apart, you will, you will see that there's pretty good evidence that he, he was in Rome when this was written. So now, what he's saying is when early Christians, in, in Peter's and Paul's days and presumably in John's day, when they refer to Babylon, who are they talking about? That's a code word they all knew. They hear Babylon, what do they say? Rome. So this is, as far as Peter's concerned, for whatever reasons, he's. He, and the Christians, they're using a code word here, yep. probably, yep. to, to kind of save their scalps. They knew what they were talking about. They knew it was, ba it was Babylon was Rome. Yeah. They, they okay, we need to keep moving. The woman is described, now remember, this is the woman who started out as a pure woman that fled to the desert. And now she's drunk, quote, drunk with the blood of God's people and the blood of those who were killed because they had been loyal to Jesus, in verse 6. And John was even was amazed, even appalled when he saw her. So here is a church entity which is drunk with the blood of God's people. Notice it doesn't call them a church here. Blood, drunk with the blood of God's people and the blood of those who were killed because they've been loyal to Jesus. So here's a church presumably claiming to be Christian who's killing God's people. That might give us some clues. Well, in our previous lesson, we discussed this passage suggesting the woman who escaped the fled into the wilderness in Revelation 12, verse 14, seemed at that time to be a pure woman who had been given birth to the Christ child. That's what Revelation 12 says. But in Revelation 17, she seemed to have completely changed and was described as the famous prostitute, and now she's drunk with the blood of God's people. Is it possible that any Christian church could have changed that much over a period of time? Well, we're we talking... Uh 10 years, 60 years, or are we talking three or 400 years? Or 2,000 years almost. You know, I, I think you could still make a case that we have two women here. Mm -hmm. Mostly because of the end of cha chapter 12. Mm -hmm. Seems like the woman didn't get corrupted because uh, the devil didn't get, a, get a, his way with her. 
And then on channel 17, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a TV. No, uh, verse 17, it talks about the woman as being the woman sitting on many waters. Yeah, well, like that's, that's she's like she is the one that represents the water coming out of the jaws of the mouth. So I, I think you can look at it that way and say that we have two different, two different um, well, women here. But you know, you can... What, what we have in the book of Revelation, if you have to go by just what we have in the book of Revelation, you have a woman who flees into the desert, it's exactly the same word, and then a little while later, John is taken out into the de and she's being pursued by the dragon. A little while later, John is taken out, well, quite a long time later, John in vision is taken out there to the desert, and what does he see? He sees a woman dressed in purple and scarlet and having all these fancy gold and so forth and precious pearls, etc. And she's sitting on this dragon beast, which we've identified as the devil. But do you think that just because he sees another woman there that it's going to be the same one? If we're going to stick with the book of Revelation and we say that's the only woman who's been identified as being out there so far. We haven't you know, you could say there's another church, but, well, but then if you look at historically, what do you, what do you have? Historically, you have uh, the Christian church, which when Constantine said, okay, let's, let's, you know, yeah, let's yeah, make it. Yeah, but you're using your interpretation here to try to figure out what it's saying. No, I'm trying but to. But I'm, I'm yeah. trying, I'm, I'm just looking at what it's saying first. Yeah. And then coming up my, with my interpretation. Okay. And, I, I and I'm just that. looking, I'm just looking. Yeah, I can see how it, how it, um, you know, can be interpreted that way, but I'm just looking at it first before you yeah, make any yeah. interpretation. And I, I think there's still a case for two, two different women here. It's but, just um, the woman, yeah, if, if what you said well, in the, the past. Well, the woman, the, the, the. Well, in the what? past, in the past, uh, Ken has pointed yeah. out, and we'll see if it's consistent. If we use the definite article, in Greek. it means in the Greek it means that it was referred to. Uh, it's referring before. back to something that already was. Already, yeah, but it's already been already, already identified. I'm trying to find where that V is at. That would be in Greek. I know, but where is it used? Well, seventeen four says the woman was arrayed in purple. That, that's one place I see though. Seventeen three. I saw a woman. It says in my translation, but my understanding is the Greek is the. It says a woman. a prior woman. That's in that chapter three. So my question is, why did the translators use a instead of the? Well, I mean that would require us to to have a careful look at that. Give me just a moment, and I will, if you want me to do that, I can. Well, well, still the two different ways of using those articles. Well, we, we, are there. well, it, th there's no difference between this uh, in in three and four. There's no difference between these. There's not two women, different women there. Because it's a woman sitting on a scarlet beast and so forth, and the woman are draped in purple and scarlet. So we know that's okay. got got to be the same woman. It was the okay. same woman that was referred to back in chapter 12. That's that's what I think we're trying to identify. Um, hold on just a second here. I'm going well, to. In a very less theological way to look at that, if John is trying to write things in code. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't he find a different word for a he's different not person? It, though he's writing down what he saw, so okay. he's not really but making code up. He is. He's, no, he's because he knows that if he well, doesn't make up code, it won't get off the island. Is he seeing a dragon? Is he seeing? Well, well come on now. This and by this the way, the, 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 if the Greek word us, is here. If you turn this all into code, well then the the power of revelation, I think, just goes away because no. Because Revelation is speaking about meta truth that's painted on things. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's how I see it. But if you just make it code, just to keep from from getting caught. Well, it did have well, some meaning to those at at that particular time. Mm -hmm. So it, you can't. Uh, There's the amount of code that that you could have there. It, it still has to be. Yeah, okay. Well, well I think we can go on yeah, with let's, your let's, presentation. Let's here. look here at verse 7. It looks like God and through the Holy Spirit and John ex plan to explain it to us. The angel, Why are you amazed? The angel asked me. I will tell you the secret meaning. Now that sort of suggests a code. The secret meaning of the woman, and it's the woman in Greek, and of the beast that carries her, the beast with seven heads and ten horns. It's the beast the woman is talking about the one 
in, in Greek. That suggests something we've already talked about. I mean, it's a secret meaning. That is used after he, what he saw there about yeah. the, the woman that was riding on the, um, the dragon, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So using the there uh, doesn't tell you anything about skipping clear over to that to go into chapter 12. You know, it's consistent with the rest of the Bible. God has always had a problem with his church staying pure. It never, it always goes into some kind of uh, corruption with um, pagan or whatever. So here's a lady, she goes into the desert and she just couldn't resist all the fineries and status and whatever. Uh, the dragon wooed her over oh. and here she comes out. Historically. And, and the story of God's church, uh, God's church is always uh, never staying pure, always uh, corrupting. So this is just like consistent with what happened to Israel, what happened in the Old Testament. Do you think that if the Do you think that if the Christian Church had remained pure, we would have had a Dark Ages? No, I don't think so. There, it was a whatever it was is a relatively small number that that, that was. They remain pure. Pure, yeah. pure, yeah. So we have okay. we have kind of a similar thing here. Is the Dark Ages only worse and toward the end of time and it, it appears that we have uh, what was originally a pure Christian church that somehow has some part of it's gotten dramatically corrupted and it's attacking those who are true to God. Yeah, it says right there it, she's drunk with the blood of God's people. So we would have to, if we're going to make this fit anything, not that we should you know, spend all our time looking in history, but we need to find some group that's in fact attacked and, and killed people that appear to be faithful to God. But, but if this is dealing with end times, and many people say we're in the end times, mm -hmm. then we're looking at something that God's people would be facing at the end of time. Yeah. So, so we, go to, go go, we go to, to verse 8. What is implied by beast who was, and now it gets more complicated. Now we're supposed to be getting the explanation, right? He says, I'm going to explain it to you. Now we go to verse 8. This beast was once alive, but lives no longer. It is about to come up from the abyss and will go off to be destroyed. The people living on earth whose names have not been written before the creation of the world in the book of the living will all be amazed as they look at the beast. It was once alive, now it no longer lives, but it will reappear. What is John trying to tell us? Is it perfectly obvious what he's talking about? No. Can you just tell us rather than <laughs> us guess? Well, I don't understand why you say, what is John trying to tell us? He's hearing it from the angel. Yeah. Well, okay, but John, know, put he's, it down he's in words. He's, John is struggling with having to I know, put but it down in, in, in words that we have making to translate. It's making it sound like he's, he's the one that's creatively coming up with okay. this. But he's actually writing down what he saw in his vision. Yeah. Okay, so what is the angel trying to tell us through John then? Is this, is this abyss a key word here in helping to define? Yes, yes, it is abyss. What do we know about the abyss? Well, the devil seems to hang out there. The devil seems to hang out there. Back in chapter 11, it says that he was given the key to the abyss. Is that a clue? Um, and he's the red dragon. Who is the devil? In what sense can we say that that no longer lives? I mean, hasn't the devil always been alive? Where, where is this, he no longer lives business? Well, we noticed that in Revelation 12, verse 17, something interesting happened. Something that I hadn't even thought about until relatively recently. The dragon was furious with the woman, that's the part I always focused on, and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants. What's the went off mean? Well, I went and looked up my Greek, and the word is departed. He went away. Up hell then, anyway. Was he went underground, so to speak, or just? So well, he's out of the picture for right now. Yeah. That, that, so that is that the beast that uh, is not at this. At that that, that sounds time? like it is not, isn't it's, it? And it's, it's one of the one of the seven. Mm -hmm. And it's and it says. We, or you're, let's go ahead. And then yeah. We'll, well, and we noticed that this beast. Has, has missed a lot of human history, apparently. He went off back in chapter 12, and now the next time we hear from him is Revelation 16, 13, where it says, And I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. So whoever this is down there, we have three choices. Okay, It has to be the dragon, would be the devil. It has or the beast or the false prophet. Right? Now, why would the 
devil depart. Yeah, but it still says to make war against yeah. the rest of his offspring. So when the angel was talking in 17 like he's he's not alive 12, now. 17, yeah. 12, well, 17. I mean, yeah, in chapter 17. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. So um, and why if would he's not alive, how can he attack... How can he attack okay. the other people? And it's a, wording that, it's a wording that we have a problem with, so let's think about that. If someone is winning the battle, in fact, it looks like they've won the war, how hard are they fighting? They may not feel like it's necessary to do a lot of fighting. If the devil is almost in totally control of the Christian church that dominated the world, what happens? Does it? What does that sound like? The devil himself, even today, I would say, the devil is trying to pretend like it doesn't exist. And how many people believe that the devil doesn't exist? Many. A lot of people do believe that the devil doesn't exist. Is that as if he's dead? Or he was, he was. and he was not, and then he's going to be again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting to notice, just in passing, we've talked about this before, that the seven heads and ten horns match the heads and horns in that back in Daniel 7, 3 through 8, and 15 through 20, those four beasts that are back there. So presumably, I mean, this can't be an accident. John has to be referring to something that's related to those things. And who do those four beasts refer to back in Daniel 7? Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. Okay, there they are. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And what do we know about the relationship between those four nations and God's people with the Jews in those days? Severe. Yeah. Captive. Yeah. These, these nations dominated them. They enslaved them. They deported them in some cases. I mean, these weren't friends of God. Not at all. Well, then we notice something else another possibility Gary here's time for you to speak up the dragon re the dragon surrogate receives a fatal wound Revelation 13 3 and Adventists have traditionally understood that to mean the, the referred being referred to the time when the, the uh, Pope was taken captive in 1798 yes. okay now this is another interesting point here it's ahead of the dragon it's not. Oh, no, the dragon has been there all along. It's not I know, but it, it's one of the heads, isn't it, that's been <coughs> wounded? Yeah, one of the heads has been fatally wounded. Okay, now, how do you connect that with the woman? Well, I mean, that's a fair question. Uh, and you have to no. look at the historical side yeah. of it. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, I'm talking about revelation here. I'm not talking about the interpretation. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. So we're about time to, it's about time for us to take a break, but this is a question, a fair question. If the woman represents the church, what do, this, what do these beasts, what do these surrogate beasts now refer to? We've suggested very strongly that the dragon beast with the seven heads and ten horns refers to the devil. Now we have this surrogate beast who's a leopard body, da-da, and all seems to fit with those four nations back from there, and are they doing the devil's bidding? It sounds like it. And now one of those heads is presumably wounded, and we're going to have to find out what, try to guess what that means when we come back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. Maybe you're as confused as we are, but let's see what we can do with the rest of this. We have churches being represented by women. We've, that's pretty clear in the book of Revelation that uh, women represent churches. Now we have beasts whose heads are wounded and so forth like that, and, and then they're healed. And, and now where are we going next? Well, let's look at verses 9 to 11. This calls for wisdom and understanding. Yeah, maybe more than we have, huh? The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. And I can remember when I was in college, someone pointing out that Rome was built on seven hills, and that's the answer. Well, but what about the seven kings? What do they refer to? Is that still seven hills? Five of them have fallen. One still rules, and the other one has not yet come. When he comes, he must rule only a little while. And the beast was once, that was once alive but lives no longer is itself an eighth king who is one of the seven and is going off to be destroyed. Wow. So we've got a lot of explaining to do here, right? Is this beast that the woman is riding on who was once alive but lives no longer and who is itself an eighth king who is one of the seven is going off to be destroyed? Who is it? In order to understand the idea to be conveyed by was and is not and is to come, which some translations describe as another possibility is was once alive but lives no longer but it will reappear, we need to remember some things we read earlier in the book of Revelation in chapters 1 and 4. And there, notice very carefully chapter 1, verse 4, from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace be yours from God who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits in front of his throne. And if we drop down to verse 8 in that same chapter, I am the first and the last, says the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and who is to come. So we have is, was, is to come. And that's literally the word for coming. In fact, the word here is paremi, which means to be present, to come, literally. Now, so if we have here God being described as is, was, is to come, and his opposite being described as was, is not, and is to come, does it sound like someone's trying to imitate? It does to me. Yeah. Is Satan or the devil the king of imitation? That well, is Satan's oh. MO. He, he mm -hmm. imitates God. What we, and what we see is this. The devil wants, God, wants to be like God. He wants God's power. He doesn't want to be really like God. He wants God's, to be in God's place and God's, have God's power. So what do you do? If you can't really accomplish that, then you try to imitate. Okay? And he's got it. And this was and is not is to come. One possible correlation with that is the idea that Jesus was before a supernatural being. He came, lived on this earth, and temporarily died as a human being. Then is to come, and he's coming back. And that's the word all through the New Testament they use to describe his second coming. Now, would Satan be active in the world, then he departs for a while, and Hi. now he'll, we're expecting that he's going to come back again. He's laying low yeah. right now, and that is that he's not. That's particularly important because not many people would argue about the first part, that he, this is Satan imitating and so forth like this, except for the people who don't believe that Satan exists. But is to come, does that imply that the devil is going to have a second coming? Is That's he going to try to imitate Jesus' mm -hmm. um, second coming? Yes. That's what's implied. Now let's look at this. Is there anywhere, we've suggested that there's two or three things you need to do when you read the book of Revelation. You need to read it several times so you have the whole picture in mind. The devil, if, if the devil is, is the... One of the seven is probably the first one, mm -hmm. and he's going to be the eighth one. So then we got six in between, mm -hmm. and we got uh, five of them that that are that are gone. Mm -hmm. Who's the sixth one that is until that eighth one comes? Okay. So Where's Satan came, and then he acted behind all those others, and now he's he in the future he's going to step well, forth. He, he has never come bodily to try to do something 
you know, here I am kind of stuff in the history of the world so far. He's going to at the end, but he hasn't yet. He worked through the serpent, yeah. step one, and yeah. then he probably dealt with the be beings before the flood. I don't know how we don't have okay. any description of that. So. Well, let, let's, let's see if we can work this through. What in the Old Testament? We've suggested one of the things about the book of Revelation is it's a lot of references to the Old Testament. What in the, in the Old Testament is close to this description? And the closest come is in Exodus 3, 14. What story is that? This is God speaking to Moses at the burning bush. And what did he say? I am who I am. That is what you must say to them. The one who is called I am has sent you to me. That's the closest correlation we can find in the Old Testament. And there are lots of other places. If we had time, we would look at Exodus 6, verse 3. John 8, 24, 28, and 58, where Jesus himself says, I am, referring to using the name for God, and then Hebrews 13, 8, that also refers to that. There are two things we need to mention about this expression. One, it's not easy to translate. The personal name of God, Yahweh, that four-letter unpronounceable word, according to the Jews, is actually a Hebrew verb. How many people do you know who have verbs for names? Certainly none of us would argue about the fact that God has always been, He was, He is, and He will come, continue to exist for eternity. But that is not what the passage actually says. It says He is coming back. Now, don't we believe that He's coming back? Yes. Yeah, we absolutely believe He's coming back. So the expression, who is to come, is from the Greek word paremi. We've already mentioned that very briefly. Uh, in this context, we need to remember that the God of the Old Testament, and this is an important point, the God of the Old Testament is who? Sometimes mistakenly thought to be the Father was actually Jesus. And I don't have time to read these verses, but 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Luke 24, 44, John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus himself says, and Paul says, hey, the God of the Old Testament was Jesus. So if we're going to learn about what Jesus is like, we have to include whatever he did in all of the Old Testament. And if you are interested in seeing this material and get the handout that we use, uh, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Many Christians believe that the God of the Old Testament is the Father whom they regard as somewhat harsh and dictatorial. That's not true. In fact, at least during the Gospels when Jesus was here on this earth as a human being, the Father was the God of the Gospels. Jesus... Well, yeah. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Yeah. Him and the Father are the same. And for those of you who believe in the writings of Ellen White, she said, had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, humbling himself, veiling his glory, that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. That's from the little book, That I May Know Him, page 338, paragraph 4. By contrast with the expression describing God's presence and coming, the clear difference between it and the one we've talking about, we're trying to explain now is the is not part. God is never a time when he was not. So what does that imply? Well, it's pretty clear that whoever's writing this, whoever's responsible, is trying to make a contrast, in contrast to God, right? So the words used for God, he was, was not... No, the words used for God, he w is, he was, and he is to come. Okay, so God never dies in there. No. Okay? And the words for Satan? He is, he, he was, he is not, and he is to come. Okay, so there is a difference. Yes. So, and if you look at Revelation 13, let's look at a few couple of verses. Let's look at verse 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded. So that would be the is not period, right? But the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. So they were amazed by the fact that this, me, this beast is what? Healed, right? Look at verse 12, same chapter, Revelation 13. It used the, very, the vast authority of the first beast in its presence. Who is the first beast? 
Do you remember who the first beast was? That's the dragon, isn't it? The devil. The devil. And now somebody here on this earth is using the vast authority of the devil. It forced the earth and all who live on it to worship the first beast whose wound was, had healed. So there's some human power, apparently, some human group or authority that's trying to force humanity to worship who? The devil. Look at verse 14. And it deceived all the people living on earth by the means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. So now he's even performing miracles to get people to believe that he is what? What does he want people to believe? That he's God. That he's God. The beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. And by the way, Jim, you asked the question about the beast question before. Here in verse 14, here's the beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast. Mm -hmm. So the dragon can also be referred to as a beast. Now, beasts are nations and countries. <clears throat> Do nations and countries actually bargain with the devil in order to get power? Or do nations and countries, by turning away from God, automatically start doing the devil's bidding? I mean, do these countries make a conscious <coughs> choice that we are going to uh, throw our lot in with Satan? I don't think they do. But Have by you ever heard anybody say I, he sold his soul to the devil? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Sold their soul for rock and roll. Movie people sell their soul to the devil. Uh, they're pretty blatant about it at times, and, and political leaders too. too. Well, let's look at some possibilities here. We've said here are the contrast. What does this mean? There are three possible explanations that we know of for this contrast. One, this is an intentional contrast in ontology. We'll talk about that word in a moment. It means essential nature or being. Is the devil essentially different than God? Absolutely. Absolutely. God is a creator. The devil is a creature. God can create. The devil can't create. God is a self-existent one. Satan's very life depends upon God. Uh, if God stops sustaining him, he's what? He's dead. Okay? So there's an essential difference between the two. No question about that. Is that the difference that we're talking about? Or two, this contrast could also be seen as a difference in methodology. What's the difference in methodology? Satan is using lies, stealth, deceit, secrecy. We've read several <coughs> verses already that talk about his lying and deceiving and so forth to accomplish his goals. In contrast, what do we find from God? What's God doing? Transparency. What we see God doing, whenever he's doing anything, who's watching? Hundreds of millions of angels. Is he trying to hide? If you're standing in front of 100 million angels, are you, are you going to be successful at hiding? I mean, that's not what you do when you're trying and to hide, is it? Another thing is God is truth, mm -hmm. and Satan is lies and deception. Father of lies. It's so relieving to know that there is a being that's truth, because truth is something that's rare in our world today. Okay. And the third possibility is that this is a part of the storyline. We've been following a kind of story through here, and it's not always exactly clear, but it could be a part of the storyline. The dragon went away in Revelation 12, verse 17, and he's back in Revelation 16, verse 13. This does not imply an actual death and resurrection on both sides. We know about the death and resurrection of Jesus, there's, and of course, there's not a time when he was not. And now the dragon may be trying to imitate that in the best way he can. Is he going to claim that he is God? Is he going to claim that he is Jesus? And he's going to point to these verses and he can say, remember, I was dead and now I'm alive, claiming that he's Jesus. So how do you feel about these three possibilities? They all sound feasible. Okay, let's, let's see, let's explore it a little bit more. Does, does that also fit the, the thousand years, the millennium, when the devil is thrown into the... the well, uh, that would say that we, we're going to read when we get to chapter 20 that the devil is thrown into the abyss. And we've, we've read here that this beast has come out of the abyss, so it, it fits. It's not talking about exactly the same time period. But what if... What if um, Revelation is really pointing, putting those two together somehow? Putting 
putting Revelation the, 17 with Revelation 20. Putting the fact that um, he's been thrown into the abyss yeah, yeah. for the, the thousand years and yeah. this, that there's some sort of connection between the two. Um, okay, well, the difference, the, the challenge here is, in that respect, would be, it says here the devil went away. When we get to Revelation 20, we're going to struggle with a verse which says he was grabbed, he was thrown, he was locked. That doesn't sound like he's going away. I mean, that's, that sounds like somebody else is trying to lock him in the abyss. Now, we're going to see that may not be the whole story, but... You don't call that withdraw. No. You call that uh, thrown the into prison. the abyss. Yeah. yeah. So, so the difference between the two is that one, he was forced, and the other one, he did it on his free will? Well, at least it doesn't sound like it's talking about the same event. Okay. So now, verse 11, as, we are, as if we were not confused enough, this dragon-like beast was, quote, once alive, but lives no longer, is itself an eighth king, who is one of the seven and is going off to be destroyed. Okay, what does all this mean? Does it mean that whoever the seven heads or seven kings or seven hills are referring to, that this eighth individual is somehow the power behind all of them? Now, we don't have any beasts that have eight heads, do we? No, we haven't mentioned any eight-headed beasts. Well, it's just like a deceptive person to be in the background and pull strings. Yeah, yeah. Well, to me, it looks like this eighth person is the dragon without heads. Well, there's a possibility. Let's see if so. that possibility fits. In Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, we have some clear, clear words. Now, here's a case where the prophet starts talking about an individual here on this earth, and then pretty soon he's obviously talking about someone much larger. King of Babylonia, bright morning star, and I would remind you that that word is phosphorus in Greek, and it's Lucifer in Latin. You have fallen from heaven. Now, this is not talking about real king of Babylon. Where are you reading? Well, I'm reading Isaiah 14, verse 12. In the past you conquered nations, but now you've been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to heaven to place your throne above the highest stars. What's, uh, what's, who are the stars in the Old Testament? Angels. Angels. Uh, uh, Job 38, 7. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble. You said you would climb to the top of the clouds and be like the Almighty, but instead you've been brought down to the deepest part of the world of the dead. So who has always wanted to be in the place of God? Satan. Satan. The devil. Ezekiel 28 uh, says basically the same thing. I'm not going to read, starting from verse 11, all it talks about what he wore and all the gems he wore, etc. But um, it's very interesting. In, in verse 18, you did such evil in buying and selling that your places of worship were corrupted, so I set fire to the city and burned it to the ground. All who look at you now see re you reduced to ashes. In the, in the more traditional translation, look at the New American Standard Bible uh, in verse 18. By the multitude of your iniquities and the uprightness, unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth and the eyes of all you see. It's interesting that somehow or other, this beast is eventually going to be destroyed from within himself. So the original sin was want of power, want of prestige. Greed, envy. And Greed, envy, want of power, want of prestige. But to accomplish that, he had to deceive. Mm -hmm. And that was a method to get power, prestige. Yeah, to tell lies and sugar-coated with truth yeah. to make it believable and, and And his end is going to be some kind of internal combustion inside him? That's what it sounds like. Yeah. So now, we've identified three beasts. Let's see if we can say clearly who they might be. There's a red, dragon-like beast with seven heads and ten horns described in Revelation 12, 3 and 17, 3. Okay, those... Clearly, those refer to the same beast. Two, there's a leopard-bodied be sea beast with feet like a bear and a mouth like a lion described in Revelation 13, 1 and 2. And three, a lamb-like two-horned beast which comes up out of the land. I, I hope you got the difference between lamb-like and comes up out of the land described in Revelation 13, 11 to 14. 
The first and the second of these beasts each have seven heads and ten horns, but one is a red dragon, and the others are others a le is a leopard-bodied beast. The red dragon is wearing crowns on its heads. The leopard-bodied sea beast is wearing crowns on its horns. Okay, does that tell us anything? Suggest that. Well, now what does that suggest? Wearing crowns on a head versus wearing crowns on horns. I, I, let, let's hold that okay. because okay. that's going to be a, a significant point. We want to discuss okay. it a little bit later. Look at Revelation 9, 1 and 2. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet. Now we're going back here. I saw a star which had fallen down to the earth, and it was given the key to the abyss. The star opened the abyss, and smoke poured out of it like smoke from a large furnace. The sunlight and the air were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. Now, star, a fifth angel saw a star. We already suggest that stars might be referring to angels. And he's given the key to the abyss. So an angel who fell from heaven is given the key to the abyss. Do we know who that is? Satan. Well, look at Revelation 11, 7. When they finish proclaiming their message, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will fight against them. He will defeat them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the streets. And it's talking about defeating and, and, and against the, the, the uh, back in verse 4 of Revelation 11, the two witnesses, which we believe refer to the scriptures. So who's the worst enemy of the scriptures? Satan. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. And then 17.8, which we've looked at a couple of times. Now that beast was once alive, but lives no longer, is about to come up from the abyss, will go off to be destroyed. So here's an, an angel that fell from heaven, given the key to the abyss. A little while later, we find out he comes out, he unlocks the abyss, he fights against the word of God. And now in Revelation 8, 17.8, we have... He was, was once alive, lives no longer, about to come up from the abyss, go off to be destroyed, and so forth. The people living on earth whose names have not been written before the creation of the world in the book of the living will all be amazed that they look at the beast that was once alive, now it lived, no longer lives, but it will reappear. So the people who living on earth whose names have not been written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, that would be the people who are, who are written in the book of the living, who would they be? The Christians. Saved. Presumably those are God's people, right? So the other people are going to be whose people? Satan's people. Satan's people. See, I hate to say that. I mean... Um, yeah. But that's, what it, that's what's implied here, isn't it? We mentioned earlier that the word here for both of these is to come is the word parousia. Some Christians want to say that the parousia is a rapture, but Parousia is the word used in the New Testament all through to refer to Christ's second coming. And here it suggests that the devil is going to have a second coming. Is that possible? Well, if the devil has a second coming, it has to be before Christ, because yeah. when Christ comes, the earth is going to disappear. Done. So Satan's parousia or whatever has parousia. to be before Christ. Yeah. So what this is suggesting now is that when Satan comes back, he wants to look like Christ. He wants to imitate Christ. He wants to, as far as possible, get people to believe that he is Christ coming back. See, all of that's in that. Well, in the wilderness, Satan wanted Christ to bow down and worship mm -hmm. him. So in the world, Satan is going to want all, the, all of us to bow down and worship him. Mm -hmm. He wants to be treated like God. He wants to be God, or at least to be treated like God. Well, we already looked at Revelation 16, 13, where it talks about war breaking out and what's going on in that verse we better look at it revelation 16 13. war breaking out in heaven then i saw three no oh. then i saw three unclean spirits like that looked like frogs they were coming out of the mouth of the dragon the beast and the mouth of the beast and the mouth of the false prophet they are the spirits of demons that perform miracles these three go off to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the battle of the great day of god almighty and if we drop down um to verse um I'm sorry here. It talks about how they will fight. Yeah, verse 15. No. 13. Where is it talking about they fight against each other? 13. Yeah, that's, that's identifying where the unclean spirits come from. But uh, further down here. Several places in the Bible, 
it mm-hmm. seems that God's enemies end mm-hmm. up fighting each other. Mm-hmm. They can't get along. They fight each other. And oh. God's people just uh, win just because the other people knock themselves out. Is yep. that what we're looking we're at? We're going again? to see that in several places here. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're coming to a conclusion here. So I want to, I want to drop down here and see if we can, we can uh, figure this out. Um, one possi- some possibilities. Um, and in fact, we're not going to get through all of this. <laughs> we have suggested, let's look at the, the possibilities and then we're going to have to take this up next week. We have suggested that the usual explanation for the book of Revelation and all the stuff we've been talking about is that it is a description of the Roman Empire would be on one side and the imperial Roman cult, particularly with reference to Nero. Now, why do they say that? They say that because, one, they don't believe the devil exists, and two, they don't believe that even God can predict the future. So when John is writing, way back in those days, he has to be writing about something that either happened before him or happened in John's day. And without going into a lot of detail, you can look through people who believe that kind of stuff, and you discover that they absolutely can't agree among themselves. They have all kinds of different explanations. Some start in one place, some start in another place, and it's all just hodgepodge and they, they can't agree. So we can't agree with them either. We think that they don't know what they're talking about and uh, we're going we're gonna to try to come to an answer to that when we, when we talk about it next week. Um, but if you, if you shirk your responsibility and you say, well, we can't understand this, there's no way we can get through it, um, are we just going to say the book of Revelation is impossible? Can't do that. There must be an explanation. So let's see if we can, we can do this. Maybe some of these heads represents maybe nations and not just Caesars, because it doesn't, there's no way you can make the Caesars fit. Maybe there's some other individuals playing into this story. But those are the questions we'll have to save. I hope that you are a regular visitor to us, to our program, and that you'll be able to be with us next week. We'll try to pull all these pieces together. See you then.